on the set of BookView now at BookCon 2015. Gail Foreman, you're here for a full hour. You're going to be with us to guest host. I got my coffee. I'm ready to go. I'm thrilled to have you. But as we were about to come on, Lauren Oliver walked by and we said, hey, come join us for a minute. And we're thrilled to have you. Yeah. I say yes to everything Gail asked me to do. So it's true. Pretty well, much. you guys know each other. And so like I saw you hugging. And I was like, ping, the light bulb went off. <laughs> I was like, all right, all right, all right. Come on up. Yeah. We share a love of upstate writing and what else? Each other. And each other. Yeah. yeah. And, and profanity that we are not going to use during this, yes, this time no. on the show. And yeah. we live like within a mile of each we other. Do. We never actually see each other I in know, our neighborhood. It's true. We live. actually see each other other places fairly often, fairly often. but not in our neighborhood. We yeah. both live in Brooklyn. Okay. And we never see each other there. We always talk about working together. We don't. <laughs> but we managed to like spend a good yeah. amount of time together. I, I spent a week upstate in your house without yes. you, but I knew which room was haunted immediately. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. There's a ghostly presence up there. Um, so. And it's yeah. great. And, it's and great. I'm a huge fan of her work. And I remember I when first, as an author, you have that weird situation where people come up to you and they're, you're like, they say, you made me cry or you made me lose night's sleep. And your appropriate response is, thank you. Yeah. And I, when I read Lauren's debut novel, I had that experience. So I read Before I Fall and stayed up all night long, unable to put it down. And I was on tour and I needed to sleep. And I think I Facebooked you and a message the next day. Like, you kept lost me a yeah. night's sleep. I love this book so much. And it's been like that. Well, you know, since. it's so funny because Gail and I also tend to be interested in very similar th themes in our books. So our works have kind of paralleled each other at a lot of different phases. Mm -hmm. um, so even earlier this year, we both did an event together and we were really, I was really surprised by all of the real parallels in, in the books to, to one another. And that was true of Before I Fall and If I Stay. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, it's fun. You know how to make people cry. I mean, yeah. I think that's something you both sort of got. You just got. twist hard enough. Heart <laughs> wrenching. I right mean, you hear the these ear, words. It really works. So you do like a search. The words that come up do kind of match sometimes. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Although you're playing around too, Lauren, because you just written this book. When I talked to you in Miami, you had written, you know, moved sort of into the adult yeah. realm. Yeah. Although I think that that's sort of a weird yeah. term that I don't always understand. Yeah. Does Nor does like anybody porn. else. Yeah. yeah, I know. I wish. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and now you have Vanishing Girls. Yeah. So Vanishing Girls is new, and then I have a middle grade series launching this fall. But and I mean, I know, and you're working on a bunch of different things too. I mean, yeah. I think, as you say, I mean, it's hard to know how relevant and pertinent is, you know, how relevant the the kind of labels are. And I also think that just for writers in general, especially writers with incredibly diverse reading tastes, as I as I have, and I you have. It's not that interesting to, to think about categories, right. um, and that's not how you come up with your ideas. Yeah, you know? I don't think there would be categories if there weren't shelves in a bookstore. Right. Exactly, right. I think it's the bookstore's would... fault. <laughs> I think, I... Yeah, I mean, the categories for us are the ages of the protagonists of our yeah. novels. Right. So, yeah. you know, I'm working on a middle grade novel now because I wanted to write about a 10-year-old, and I'm working on an adult novel now because I wanted to write a novel from the point of view of a mother and a wife, and you can't really do that yeah. in my age. Yeah. Right. So. Unless you're a teen mom. Yeah, and then it's all yeah. different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a different Then mom. it's an after school special. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so tell me, because you guys have been to a lot of book expos and, and book con, book con is relatively new though. This is the uh, a new sort of customer facing, reader facing event. Mm -hmm. um, and they get to get close, they get to talk. And there's such enthusiasm in this building. And I don't know if the words energy and books often in are Java attached Center. to each other. Yeah, yeah, Center. Center. Yeah. But, yeah, exactly. but usually, <laughs> <laughs> usually, it's very exciting. You know, I mean, I think the idea of mixing those things is really fun for people who love books. And it's different than Comic Con because books have a place at Comic Con, but here it's that sliver, that, that, that important yeah. element. It just lives on its own and has so much energy. Well, I'm definitely feeling that since within 30 seconds of walking in, I was conscripted into being on this TV show. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, but um, I think it's great. And I, I really do think it's interesting because, you know, there have been so many new articles now about the role of fandoms yeah. just in, in general, but, but specifically related to books and the kind of stratospheric rise and popularity of certain books. And obviously that's facilitated by... Um, online you know the fact that everyone can communicate online but i also think it's really significant that like ultimately no matter how wired we are any generation is you really just want to go and see people and interact with them in person right and like meet your favorite authors and meet other people that are fans that you've been speaking to online that's right i think it's important because as authors we spend so much of our time alone in a room with our characters and it's nice to get out here and engage with the fans and it's nice to kind of Put the phones down, like 
have a moment together. Yeah. And sometimes those moments happen like in that room when you're doing that panel or in the signing line. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's a different experience than you have day to day. Yeah, and you know, I was actually saying to a friend of mine, because this, you know, BookCon this year is on the direct heels of BEA, and I was saying that, you know, despite obviously the Javits Center not being the most scenic place in Manhattan, not the most scenic area of Manhattan, I've come to really like BEA because, A, to me it now signifies the start of summer since yes. I've been going to so many, so many of them. Day. I know, exactly. I'm like, yep, it's After BEA. After BEA, you I can wear white. Yeah, yes. but I also realize, like, this, I see, I actually truly adore and like 98% of the people in this industry, yeah. the writers, the publishers, the editors, I mean, the ones I know, the ones I just meet. And often I don't get to see them except at conventions like this. And it is truly deeply pleasurable to know that I'm going to come and see people that I really enjoy talking to and I really enjoy hanging out with. Yeah. Um, and I can only imagine, you know, of course, that's how the fans feel as well. But even for me, I mean, it's, it's the same experience. Yeah. I, you'll have to then, I love all the people in the publishing industry too, but you'll have to apologize to all the publicists as I was making the calls. I was like, you will get them to our set. You know, like, uh, they do such good work. Yeah. It is cool to see the combination of uh, publishers talking directly to readers, I mean, while they're here. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I also think your fandoms are different on, on the YA side than they are with the adult side. We've talked to a lot of quote unquote adult writers this week. And there's not this crush of people trying to get close to them necessarily. They're like, I think that's John Gershwin right there. But that's you know it. Un unlike you guys, when there's like, they see you and they want to be with you, they want to talk that's to you. That's because adults feel like they have to play it cool. Yeah. I yeah. imagine there's a lot of adults who are like, that's John Grisham. I really want to go up and get a picture yeah. with him, but yeah. I can't do that because yeah. I'm embarrassed and self-conscious. And when you're younger, A, it's a different generation where they're like, that technology and that whole thing is much more comfortable to them. But also, you're younger. I think they're just like right in it. And I also think a lot of younger, I mean, I think also at that age, if you're really talking about the teen fans, I mean, at that age, what's so important to you is that you feel recognized for being a person, for existing, for, I mean, I was just thinking too, the other day when I was in the bathroom, but I was in like a public bathroom and you know, people still write, I was here and they write, you know, LS plus, you know what I mean, whatever. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It was you, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, but they do that and I was like, it's so funny that no matter, again, no matter what the technology is, people are still just taking this time to be like, I'm imprinting myself here, right. I have a crush on somebody here. And it's the same thing that teens feel, I think, seeing an author, they wanna tell you that they connected to your work and they wanna also have you just recognize them as you know, a thinker and a reader and a person, you know, and I think that that need either lessens or maybe just gets sublimated or hidden as you get older, yeah. you know. Well, I'm thrilled that you ambled on by. Thanks. And I'm Thanks thrilled for that we me. wrangled you <laughs> onto the set. Uh, Gail, you're with us for the next Time 45 minutes or so, yeah. <laughs> and we're going to be out in just a little bit with Jason Reynolds. We're excited to have him here too. But thank you so much, Thanks Lauren, for, for coming by me. again. It's great to have you. In the meantime, we're going to show you some more shots from the floor of BookCon 2015, and we'll be back in just a little bit. Thanks. Hi, it's Patricia Parada for BookView Now on PBS. I'm here with Saba Tahir, author of the new novel, An Ember in the Ashes. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about your new book? Sure thing. Um, An Ember in the Ashes is a young adult fantasy. It is about a girl who is fighting for her family and a soldier who's fighting for his freedom. Um, Laya lives under the brutal rule of the Martial Empire. Her brother is taken from her by Empire soldiers and thrown into prison for treason. And she has to find a way to save him and to get him back. Uh, the other character in the book is Elias. He is a soldier of the Empire. And all he really wants to do is be free of this tyranny that he's being made to enforce. But before he can do that, um, he's ordered to participate in a series of trials, which will choose the next uh, martial emperor. So when their paths cross, um, they realize their fates are intertwined and that their decisions are going to change the future of the Empire. Where did you get the inspiration for the, your story? Uh, my inspiration was twofold. Um, I grew up in the Mojave Desert in um, a very small town that was very isolated. And I felt like an outcast in that town. I felt so um, voiceless and so powerless. And um, I turned to books for comfort, um, particularly fantasy, because it was like, it would take me away to a different world. Um, so 
when I got I, when I grew older, I realized that you know I could have a voice through writing. Um, and in 2007, I decided I want to write a book. And at that time, I was working at the Washington Post, and I was an editor there. And I was reading about you know people who were truly voiceless and powerless, um, who who felt the way that I felt as a kid, but who were living in places where there was child slavery and child soldiers, where there were extrajudicial jailings, and all of those stories um, combined with sort of how you know that isolation I felt as a kid they all came together and, and planted the seed for Ember. So I find it really interesting that you work for the Washington Post. How did you find writing for journalism and changing it to writing for fantasy? How, what challenges did you face in that? You know, so I was an editor at the Post. Um, I didn't report for them, but it's a group effort um, to some degree when you're at a newspaper. Um, you are working with editors, with reporters, with photographers, with designers, and it's also um, really quick. You know, you have one day to get the paper out. You have hours to get the paper out. And then the next day is a new start. Whereas with a book, one, you're very isolated for at least the early part of it before your book gets published and you work with an editor and a copy editor and all that sort of thing. Um, so you're alone um, and you have to set your own deadlines and you have to be disciplined and you have to do your own thing. And it's also a long-term project. It's not something that you can just, you know, you write it one day and the next you're on to something else. You have to really be dedicated to your story. And, and for me, I had to be in love with the story to work on it constantly. It took me six years to write, so <laughs> it was, it was a, a quite, quite a long time to work on one, one project. And going back to your story, I love how Lai is so rebellious and so courageous. What, do you, what characteristics do you think embody the ultimate female heroine? I think that there are no, you know, there's no set of characteristics that embody that. My character starts out as a coward. Um, she was very similar to what I was at 17, which was not brave. <laughs> um, and so I think that the type of heroine I want to see is one who is honest with herself um, and who, is, who grows. And that's the only requirement for me. And how do you feel the literary heroine has? Hi, it's Rich Folly. I'm on the set of Book View Now, and this is BookCon 2015. I'm with our guest host, Gail Foreman. Thank you for being here, Gail. Thanks. And we also have Jason Reynolds. Jason, you are the author of The Boy in the Black Suit and When I Was the Greatest. Yep. Uh, it's so cool to have you here. We only have you for a few, few minutes because there's a panel of people waiting for you down there. I don't know if they're waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> they are waiting for you. But what's cool is when I talked to Gail and I asked, like, who should we get? Gail immediately brought up your name as someone we wanted to have here, and I'm so glad that we were able to put this together. Thank you. Thank you. Jason's a fellow Brooklyn guy. Yep. And Brooklyn really figures pretty prominently in, in both your books now, yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Jason, last time we met, I can't stop thinking about the writing advice that your uncle. Was it your uncle gave you? <laughs> yes. <My laughs> I, I feel like this is the it? best writing advice ever. <laughs> My uncle. So I had, you know, I come from a family of colorful people, like in the literal sense and in the <laughs> metaphoric sense, right? And, and my uncle, my uncle was this crazy sort of alcoholic, super paranoid, but like awesome dude. And he said one day, we were talking about books and uh, he was, you know, we were talking about things and he was trying to read through mine and we were having all these discussions and he said, Jason, nobody wants, and, and every, time I, every time I would talk to him, every time I would talk to him and try to tell him some long drawn out story, he would cut me off and say, Jason, like you got to you got to get to it, you know, you got to get to it. I don't want to hear all of this. I don't want to hear <laughs> all the buildup. I don't want to hear, just get to the meat. And then he said, it's the equivalent of if you were writing a novel, if you want to win audiences over, yeah. then start the novel with, and shots rang out. <laughs> He's like, and that's how you win. He's like, but you always have to sort of like skip all of the, the rigmarole and, and get to the meat, get to the action. So did you, did you like incorporate that immediately into your writing and what you were doing? Cause uh, I mean, as a young kid, I could never ever get right to the action. I would like these flowery 40,000 You know, I think because that's the way I was sort of raised and, and being around him for so long, you can't help but hear his voice, you know. So every time I'm like working on something and I'm dragging it out or every time I'm trying to set up the, set up the scene, he's, I can just hear him. You know, he's gone now, you know, but I can just hear him like, Jason, get, get to it, man. Like, I could see that advice playing out in your, in your latest book. For sure. With Lexi, because he, you get pretty straight to the action. We jump in straight away. Mom's gone. Mom's gone, funeral, yep. gets this job, yep. boom. By the first know, chapter, talk everything about is this done. Book? Is this hilarious book about funerals that you've written? Yeah, you know, it's funny because you're the first person, and thankfully you're the first person, finally somebody can say that it, it is a funny book, right? It's a, it's a book about, about death and about funerals, but more so it's a book about life, right? And, and 
and books I think books about death usually are. are about life, yeah. right? And I think what happens sometimes is that when you when you even try to write about something heavy like death, people become afraid because they see death as such a sad thing, and it is a sad thing. But funerals are when you step away from them, yeah. are sometimes really funny. Oh, I mean, and, abs be. and absurd and ridiculous. And, uh, but the and word isn't funny, but the actual event itself. The, the can event be really itself. Funny, yeah. The event itself. Well, they can also be really joyful. And they can be really joyful. Yeah. I mean, and you, and you think about the death tradition in so many different cultures all over the world, they vary, right? So whether it be, you know, if you, if you go to New Orleans, they're partying in the street, it's a parade. You know, and if you were to come to some of my family's funerals, right? I mean, all we do is basically cry for 10 minutes and then get, and then not cry. <laughs> <laughs> and then eat some food. And then eat some food yeah. and, and crack jokes and, yeah. and you know, it's, it's fun. I do think that, that you feel sometimes uncomfortable at a funeral because you're, you're oftentimes, re there's a reunion element to funerals and you're happy to see them, but then you realize, wait a minute, I'm, I, maybe I'm not supposed to, to do well, that. Yeah, and yeah. I think if you can just sort of let that go let and just go. realize, well, why here. did we wait for this? Yeah, to exactly. wait for that? And I think that when you're writing for, for children or young adults and you are, talking about serious stuff like death or funerals, all of a sudden everybody starts to get really nervous. Right. But this is this is sort of the oh, evergreen stuff that we're all interested in as sure, humans. Sure, and I and I think that's necessary. It's like the it's it's a it's a common theme across the entire human experience. We all have to kind of go through death. And so I think that this is a way for us to look at it for what it is and to also see it for the from the other side of it as as sort of like a joyous event sometimes or as a funny thing sometimes or as just sort of more more nuanced than just pain. Yeah. But the audience you write for, a lot of them, um, there's certainly plenty that do fully understand death, but for a lot of them it's the furthest idea and concept from their mind. Sure. So did you find it challenging at all when you're writing about this to think about the audience and the age groups of the people that are going to be reading it? No, you know, I didn't. And, and the reason why is because I was a young person who experienced a lot of death very early. And so I tend to live by the rule that if I experienced it, I wasn't the only one. Right. right? And I haven't been the only one. And so, yeah. you know, and so I, that, that gave me a bit of, you know, a bit, of more, a, a bit more confidence when writing it because I know for a fact that there are young people who lose their parents, especially today's time, who lose their parents to cancer mm -hmm. early. Right, breast cancer and all these cancers are sort of running rampant, and young people are are, are dealing with these things. It, it is sort of prevalent. It doesn't seem as prevalent as it does when we get older because we lose friends and family members in, in a different way. But I think a lot of young people are dealing with it. I think it's interesting because statistically, if you look at like, sorry to bring this up, but like morbidity of death by like your death rates by accidents really shoot up among like teenagers, teenagers because there's the impulse control because they're in cars for the first time so this is an age group i remember as a teen where all of a sudden i was going to funerals i was seeing peers go so i think that it's exactly the kind of age where you want to be grappling with that kind of stuff through your reading absolutely i mean 17 years old i had lost tons of friends mm -hmm. from, from things like car accidents alcohol poisoning right experimenting and going too far yeah right those kinds of things are happening yeah, yeah. well i could keep you here forever, but I know there'll be sorry, somebody guys. flagging me down. No, don't be sorry. It was really cool to have you, Jason, and uh, uh, I, I hope you have an awesome time on your panel, and thank, thank you. you for joining Gail and I here. Uh, this is Jason Reynolds. He's off to his panel now. Thanks so much for being with us. We'll come back in just a little bit. We have Jenny Han joining us next. In the meantime, thanks so much. Thank you, man. Yeah. Thanks, Gail. Great to have you. All right, now I have your real email. I'll see you on the 11th, okay? Right. Hi, it's Patricia Parada for Book View Now on PBS. I'm here with Renee Atie, author of the new novel, The Wrath and the Dawn. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for being here. Can you tell us a little bit about your new book? Yes, it's The Wrath and the Dawn. It is a YA reimagining of the Arabian Nights. It's the story of Scheherazade with a little bit of the Count of Monte Cristo, a little bit of the Beauty and the Beast thrown in. Where did you get the inspiration for doing a retelling? Um, it's kind of twofold. I'm the child of mixed race, and so I knew when I began writing a book, I wanted to make sure to incorporate diversity into it because when I was growing up, I didn't see that many books with diversity in it for children. So I knew that I wanted to have that in my books when I was writing them. And then secondly, my husband is Persian, and when I first went to visit his family when we were dating, I saw this amazing tapestry on the wall of his family's home, and I asked his mom what it was. It was like from a distance, it looked like a hundred different vignettes strung together at random. And she told me it was Tales from a Thousand and One Nights, and so it's kind of sparked the, the, uh, the story idea in my head. And from there on, I just kind of ran with the idea of, like, what would this be like as a YA novel? 
So you mentioned that you didn't experience a lot of diversity when you were reading growing up. Why do you feel like it's important to have full representation in literature, especially for young adults? So I think it's really important for uh, children to see their heroes and heroines looking back at them in the mirror. And secondly, it's also important for people to see windows into other people's lives because when they see things that aren't necessarily part of their reality, it teaches empathy. And I think empathy is one of the most important facets of reading and learning and experiencing different cultures. So. And I know your book has a very cool literary heroine telling the story. Can you tell us a little about about her? Absolutely. Um, I, whenever I was growing up and whenever I was a teen, there were so many opportunities for me to do and say things, and I didn't necessarily do and say those things. You know, when you're you you walk away and you're like, oh, I should have said that or I should have done that, and I didn't really have the courage to do those things. So I knew when I was writing a YA heroine, I wanted to write a heroine who did and said all of the things that I wanted to say. And so when I wrote Shahrazad, that's what I did. She's sort of reckless and she's very fearless, and so that's what I wanted to write in a character. I wanted to inspire girls to stand up for themselves and make sure that they said and did the things that they wanted to say and do and exist in a world that allowed them to do that. So, And how do you feel the literary heroine has evolved since, say, 20 or 50 years ago? You know, I don't... <laughs> Maybe evolved is, I think evolved is a great word, actually, because I think that they were always very strong. When I think back to some of my li literary heroines, I loved Scarlett O'Hara when I was first growing up, and I loved Elizabeth Bennet. I loved um, uh, Joe March and Shirley were some of my favorite ones, and they were always very strong. They were always very vocal. But I think nowadays it's great because we're seeing um, girls in a variety of roles. When I think of girls like Katza from Kristen Kishore's Graceling, she's not just strong in a vocal way, she's able to fight. And I'd love to see female heroines that are multifaceted in their strength. So, so you mentioned you like to see the multiple facets in sure. literary heroines. So what characteristics do you think um, unforgettable female protagonists embody? Again, I like to see in female protagonists not just the typical understanding of strength. I like to see an array of characteristics. I like them to showcase, you know, depth in all facets of their life. I like them to, you know, have a, a variety of emotions, to, to laugh, to cry, to rage, because that's the truth with human experience, regardless of your gender, regardless of your age, regardless of where you're from. We all experience a wide array of emotions, so I like to see that in my protagonists, in my heroes, in my heroines, again, regardless of their gender, regardless of where they're coming from, so yes. Do you have any tips for your readers who want to pursue writing? Um, do not give up. It's so easy to give up in the face of so much rejection. Uh, I think that this industry is definitely a lot about talent, and it is about timing, but I think more than anything, it's about tenacity. You definitely have to work at your craft, continue to do what, you, what it is that you're doing, and talk to your friends who are also writers and get a lot of feedback and grow as a writer, but don't give up. And is there anything else you would like to add about your book or about yourself? Uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed writing this book, and I hope if you enjoy it half as much as I enjoyed writing it, that will be fantastic for me because I laughed and I cried alongside my characters. I breathed with them, and if somebody turns around and tell, tells me they were completely taken away to another world, transported to another reality, that is the biggest compliment anyone could give me as a writer. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. This is Patricia Parada for Book View Now on PBS. Hello, it's Rich Folley. I'm back here now on the Book View Now set. We're at BookCon 2015. It's been a spectacular day. Amazing people coming through our set all day. And an incredible collection of really enthusiastic readers running around the Javits Center here in New York. I'm with Gail Foreman, who's been our host for this hour. Great to have you, Gail. David? And now we're with Jenny Han. Hi. And Jenny, it's so nice to have you here. It's good to see you again. Yeah, welcome back. I know you guys know each other. Um, and I know that we're going to talk a little bit about um, your books. We have a brand, you have a brand new one that mm -hmm. just came out. P.S. Yes, I still, I still love, love you. you. Which is out in the world and people are now reading it. When I last spoke with you, it wasn't quite there yet. That's right. But now you're on tour and you're talking mm -hmm. about it. But you guys, you guys have also met. I've met you on occasion. A we time just or two. came off a great panel where we were talking about friendship. And I am really, I haven't, I just started P.S. I still love you because it just came out like four days ago. Right. Um, but I'm excited that this book really focuses on the friendship because we were talking on our panel about given how prevalent platonic friendship is, like that is when you're a teenager, that is like the most important thing in your life. You don't see it that much reflected in young adult literature. I think you see it, but I don't know if it takes center stage. Exactly, that's what right? I mean. Right? Yeah. I think that it's, like um, always, it's on the side. It's always like the side thing, but 
but truly, like, I think that the, the friendships are what get you through, like, life, not just high school, but in general. So it, it is, the book does explore um, old friendships and thinking, like, I guess one of the themes is um, how, as you get older, people kind of, like, grow apart and change and, like, grow, um, it's hard to grow at the same speed, I guess. But it's interesting, I love the friendships in the first book, but those are really more the sister friendships. Yeah. I mean, like, there's a scene, there was a scene, it's about these three sisters, one goes away to college, and what happens when Margot leaves, and they all seem like they're really close, and the mom has passed away some years back. But you kind of find out later in the book that the two older sisters actually were not close. They fought quite a bit, but when there was this, this sort of big, big trauma in the family, they kind of came together for the little sister, and that way that friendship and family intersect. I think also as you get older, do you have any sisters? I do. You do? One? One sister, one brother. Yeah. Um, are you close? Yeah, my sister's like my best friend. So. Yeah, like I think, but did you get, were you always close? We broke hairbrushes over Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Fight Club, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I think my there sister... There is no Fight Club. <laughs> First rule. First rule. We're talking about Fight Club. Uh, my sister and I would argue a lot. Um, we're three and a half years apart. And then I think really when we became super close, that was when I went to college. And then I was in college and she was in high school. So she missed you. And she missed me. I missed her a lot. Um, I think I was also always in the role of like caretaker with her too. And so when you're someone's like big sis and you're almost like a parental role, it's hard to like be vulnerable and close to that person because you're yeah. just like taking care of them. Yeah. I like in, in your books the idea of these notes, these long ago written notes or notes that you wrote. You know, in the in sort of heat of passion, or in the, when you're really liking someone, or when you're breaking up with someone, as the case is often, that they live, you know, they live on sometimes well past the actual friendships themselves. Yeah, and I think you find them in your drawers and in yeah, things you've saved because they meant something to you at the time. Yeah. In a way, I think that like books are the same thing. I mean, you it's like this very intimate, personal process where you put out, you know, your story, and then it's strange to have it be in the world and other people see it. Right. You know, so it's like not dissimilar. It's funny, you talked about how that's like a sign of an early writer because you have to process something through these notes. And one of the only like best friends that I have from growing up, I'm still close with this, is a woman named Deanna. And we used to get in these fights and I would write her these letters. And then I would mail them because this is back before email. And we would make up and then she'd get the letter. <laughs> and we'd have a fight all over again. Yeah. <laughs> it almost like weirdly like brings up the emotions again. Yeah. yeah. But that's, that's such a thing you do when, you, when you're one of those people and you have to get it down on paper. But as you get older, you realize maybe you don't always send it. Maybe you don't always send it. A lot of things I think that you process as you were writing it and you're like, yeah, and this made me mad. And then like you're thinking about all those feelings. When you see the person's face yeah. and you're, you know what I mean? You kind of like forget that stuff. But then you, when you have it done on paper, it's, it's I think it's, that's different. For me, it's also the, like the notes that I received from friends, from old girlfriends, from things Did that... Them? Yeah, why though? Because now like, I have this thing where they're in the boxes and I'm you thinking... can't get rid of them, right? Should I throw them out? I'm married to this beautiful woman that right. I love very much and I have, you know, I should toss them, right? But then I open them and they're there and they smell like old paper and I'm thinking, well, what do I do with them now? Yeah. Do I just stick well, them in the what? fire? Did you read that book, uh, The Art of like Uncluttering by Marie Kondo? I have heard nothing. Sounds like I need that. Yeah, yeah you okay. need that. And there's a whole section on like old letters and artifacts. Supposed to scan them or something? No. She says, you know what? They serve their purpose. Yeah. They, the letter was received by you. You appreciated it. Yeah. Now you can like let it go. This is the thing. You realize if you have not missed something in your life for the last ten years, you will not miss it if it goes away. I feel that way about clothing as well. Her philosophy right. is like you pick up the item and you go, does this bring inspire joy yeah. within me? And if it doesn't. Then let it go. Let it go. I'm going to work on that. <laughs> but I think there's also this, for you, the process of actually putting them down on paper and processing it and being done with it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. never having to deliver it to anyone. Yeah, it's for you. Yeah. I'll keep working on that, too. So how is it, Lau, you're back on tour and people were waiting for another one of these, right? I mean, they were excited to have it. Yeah, because a little bit of a cliffhanger there. A little. Mm. <laughs> I mean, people, are you surprised that people thought it was a cliffhanger? I thought it was a, a huge cliffhanger. Well, maybe I should have shown it to you before I yeah, maybe I should have. finished it. And then you would have said, this is too big of a cliffhanger. So you didn't uh, have this, you didn't know that you were going to write a second one when you finished the first? I did know. Oh, okay. I didn't, personally, I didn't think it was that big of a cliffhanger. To me, it, the way it ends is, is it's her Spoiler being active. Spoiler muffs. Her being active in a moment. And it's hopeful. 
And so to me, it was not about like what happens between the two of them. It really was her making a decision right. to be active. Right. She has come full circle in yeah. her own journey. Well, you got a chance to answer that, and now you're out there, and so people are very excited. I mean, it was what I when I mentioned the people that Jenny Howe was coming. I mean, literally, it was very oh, no well, because the new one is out. Right. You're right at this moment. <laughs> it's happening now. Spot. It's like you're at that exact release. Come week. on, no. Jenny I mean, Han, Did you see the subway poster for for BookCon Book with our yeah, picture being on the so subway cool. poster? That was like, hey, Jenny Han, yeah. subway poster. That was cool. Yeah, when you're on the subway, come on, that's something. People who don't even read books. Facebook friends. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. They're like, oh my god, I saw you in the subway. But I do love, this is a place where the people do read books. Mm. And so this sort of fan thing that happens here is totally genuine. Yeah. And so outside, you step outside and maybe not. But in here, these are your people. I thought you are nobody. So <laughs> Inside. Well, you're on a subway. You're more than nobody. But <laughs> I, I love these books for a lot of reasons. I really love the depiction of the, the sort of the Korean because the kids the, the girls are half Korean and the way it's sort of suddenly woven in and I think there was the Halloween scene which I thought was something that probably like you would never think about if you hadn't grown up this way but the, the character no matter what she dresses up as people are like are you dressed up as a manga character yeah. <laughs> that has happened to me I, I imagine yeah. that had the year that Britney Spears came out yeah I dressed up as Britney Spears in the video oh. and so everybody, you're a manga character? yeah oh. everybody was saying that to me and I was like, no. <laughs> so she has to dress as something specifically Asian so she doesn't get that. The character. But I thought that it was such an interesting, because it wasn't a story that was about being Asian American. It was a story where that kind of suddenly wove it in and out. And you had like the interesting with the father, who's not Korean, trying to make the meal and failing, making it too salty. But things like that were, it was a little bit of a glimpse into a world that if you are not that you don't understand what it's like. It's like, oh, that's interesting, but it wasn't the kind of focal point of the story. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it was just wanting to um, write a story about a, a, an every girl, right. and, and, every, and every girl can be any girl, right? And any story is like, her story is an American story. It's like a, a type of American story. And so that was what you know I wanted to do and, and not be about like her struggle um, with her identity. Because no. I think her the way that she's growing up is very different it's like a generation removed from the way that I grew up. And so much of my growing up was, you know, being second generation. My parents, um, English was a second language, you know, and, and all the, those kind of struggles with that. And now I'm looking at that generation. It's more like my ki like older cousins' kids are that age. And it's not quite the same. And so I wanted it to really just be about, like, her story. And that's part of her, her identity, but it's not, like, it's not the whole of, of her identity. In terms of like the demand and thirst for diverse books, I find the success of this book incredibly hopeful and the fact that they put an Asian girl on the cover. That to me was really life affirming actually was was Let's high five that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we kept talking about this on Twitter and people were like, I think this could be the first YA book to hit the New York Times bestseller list with like an Asian person on the cover. And I think that could be true and it's weird because that was two thousand fourteen. Yeah. Um, but it's great because I get a lot of fan mail from people who go, oh, she's just like me. She's so me. And some of those emails are from Asian American girls, and but most aren't. Yeah. And yeah. so I think I love it. I love that the Asian kids have something for themselves to be able to look in the store and see someone who looks like them on the shelf. And you feel like that's great. But I also love um, that it's just like human um, a human story. She's massively identifiable, just in many different ways. So, you know, she, I, I imagine that if you're that girl who just has sort of felt overshadowed by a, a big sister, hasn't been able to kind of make your needs known, to see Lara Jean's journey, no matter like what your cultural background, is going to be really. Thank you, Gail. I loved the book. Thank it's you. So romantic so sweet. and fun. And I'm very excited to dive into this. So sweet. I still love you. And so do so many other people. And it's been really cool to have you here with us. Thanks, guys. We got to like Fun. kick back with Gail Foreman. I know. And I'm, Jenny in your, I'm in your apartment right now. Like this is. <laughs> we we need to make because we some she has a separate Brooklyn writing group than my Brooklyn writing group. Hers is like in a different neighborhood of Brooklyn. Occasionally, she and I will meet. I think we have to meet again. Soon. Yeah, please. like it, what is it, Honey and whatever. Ted and Honey. Ted and honey. Yeah. We'll, we'll have a Ted and Honey writing yes, day. Yes, please. Okay. I love that. We just had we just made a date right here on live. <laughs> All right, everybody, yeah. we're going to meet at Ted and Honey. We'll see you there. Well, thank you so much thank for being here, so Jenny. Much. Gail, it's you're fun. sticking around, and uh, we'll be back in just a little bit. We have Marie Lou and we have Sarah Destin still to come, so stay tuned. Look forward to seeing you really soon here at BookCon 2015. 
I'm here to go see Jennifer Armentrout for the Lux series. Uh, it's our first time and I'm really excited. Love books. I'm here because I love books. I'm here to see Nick Offerman too. To see Mindy Kaling. Aziz. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully Mindy and John Green. I really like books, so it's a lot of fun to go. And so I could see a bunch of great authors. Who's your favorite author? Um, Marie Lu. Which author are you really looking forward to seeing? John Green. <laughs> um, all the YouTubers, like Joey Graceffa. Aziz Ansari. Probably Colleen Hoover or Jennifer Armentrout. A Rainbow Rowell, probably. And what, what's your favorite book that you're looking forward to getting autographed? Uh, fangirl. What are you most excited to see at BookCon? Um, we're excited to see Mindy. Yeah. Yeah. Very. Right. To see John Green. Why do you like John Green's books so much? Because they're amazing, and I love the way he writes. What events are you looking forward to here at BookCon? Uh, the autographing by Ellen Hopkins. So, yeah, we're just looking to, like, explore and find new books. Yeah. Why are you here? Because I love to read, and we decided to come be fangirls over here. Because we're big fans of books. <laughs> yeah, we love books. Pretty much, yeah. Who's your favorite author? I don't think I just have one. I think I have, like, different people based on what I'm reading. Drama, suspense, mystery, so it really depends. <laughs> Jenny Han. We're here to see Nick Offerman yeah, and... and yeah. Yeah, we're here to see the Parks and Rec people. Also because we love them, so... <laughs> I just really like books, and I really wanted to come. <laughs> Here to see John Green. <laughs> what do you like about John Green's writing? Well, I like the characters that he makes and the plots. Why are you guys here at BookCon? Free books, but I definitely wanted to see because they had the opening, the little Cassandra Clare, and I am definitely into her, so. Just all the different authors. It's really exciting to have a lot of your favorite authors all in one place. It's Who's your favorite author? Uh, I don't know. I mean, obviously, John Green is, like, a favorite. And then you've got people like Mindy Kaling who have, like, their funny side. So it's, like, there's the best from every genre here, so. Hi, I'm Rich Folley. We're on the set of Book View Now, PBS.org, and we're here at BookCon 2015. Gail Foreman is our guest host. So happy to have you, Gail. And we're with Marie Lu right now, who's got a brand new book, The Young Elites, or fairly new book, The Young Elites. And um, as we talked about, you're profile is not only large in like literal or figurative sense, it's literally large. It's a really <laughs> large banner of you outside Thank there. You. It was really fun to see. But welcome, first of all. Thank you for having me. It's really great to have you. We, uh, when I talked to Gail, I was really excited because I said, let's put together a really cool panel of folks that we can talk to. And we had a little list that we were running through, and you were definitely on top of our list. So Thank really you. Cool. I'm honored to be here. Yeah, Thanks for having right. me. So Marie, have you met, or I mean Gail, have you met Marie before? Marie and I are always like two ships passing in the night, yeah. so we see each other <laughs> like, hi. Yeah. So this, you know, if I want quality time with Marie, I have to get her in front of a camera. <laughs> we see each other all the time, yeah. but yeah, for like 30 hi. seconds at a time. I know, it's you like, I love our, you, you I'll see you next time. Television. That's where it happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I did walk in and see, before I saw Marie, I saw Marie, like, <laughs> what is that like? Does that it freak you out? I mean, it's about a four-story, four-story banner yeah. with the the sequel to the Young Elites, which comes out in October, which is mm -hmm. called the Rose, the Rose Society. Society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. It's funny because I I got in with a friend and we were excited. We had heard about the banner, and I'm like doing this to try to find it, and she's like, no, it's it was like right next to my face, and I had to kind of do the Jurassic Park pan up towards it, and so it was very cool to see. Um, I'm glad that my face is not on there because I feel like that would be really terrifying to see like a four-story, you know. It was funny because last summer yeah, when the If I Stay Movie stuff was like plastered everywhere, God. but I was upstate, I didn't see any of it. So people oh, kept really? sending me pictures, which was the perfect way to see it because there's right. something really, it's like incredible, but it's also terrifying. <laughs> it must have been so amazing. I mean, I saw it everywhere. It was like everywhere in LA. It was pretty plastered. So, um, but yeah, so, awesome. it, it, so it was nice to see it from a distance. It's like, it's out there happening somewhere from a safe <laughs> distance. From a safe distance. It's removed. This is the opposite of remove when you're amidst your fans, you know, like walking right. around and they notice you and they see you and they know your face. So what is it like when you're able to just like walk and people are right on you? They want to talk to you. They're right there. It's very surreal to be here with the readers. And I mean, right. that's why we go to these things. It's always fun to see, you know, the faces of the people who are buying our books. Um, but it's very weird to, yeah. to have that experience of people coming up to you. They do know you. It's not like riding the subway <laughs> where, because, you know, with the authors, what I love about you authors is that you're famous in your worlds, but you can still make your way around and maybe have a normal yeah. day at Macy's or wherever you want yeah, to go. Yeah, we're totally incognito. Yeah. Not here. Not, not, here. not here, no. Yeah. It's a celebration of books, which yeah. is cool. 
to love that. We really do. So the other element is just the um, absolute enthusiasm for your series. Thank you. So tell us about um, where the book's going and, mm -hmm. and, and where you're taking it. Yeah, um, The Rose Society is the sequel for The Young Elites. And the series is definitely, has been more challenging for me to write than um, the Legend series, which is my first. And that's because the series revolves around the story of a girl who becomes a villain. And it was very, very unsettling, but interesting to be inside the head of somebody who becomes a bad person. Uh, so in the Rose Society, Adelina, who's the main character, continues her descent into being a supervillain. She's essentially like the teen version of Darth Vader. And that was one of my biggest inspirations. Were, yeah. It totally was. Uh, and so the, the Rose Society is darker than the young elites. Um, Adelina gets revenge on a lot of people. And so there's a lot of her bitterness coming to the surface. Uh, and so it was interesting to explore. Yeah. yeah. When you're writing a dark character like that, you really get to go to places that are not natural, but yeah. that are almost fun to play with because it seems so opposite of who you are as you sit next to me right now. It's it's funny you say that because I feel like like everyone has a little bit of darkness in them. Yeah. So when I'm writing her, I get those moments where yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm going to draw on that moment when I was stuck in traffic and you know people were cutting me off right. and I'm just like, I just want to destroy that. you right now. Yeah. yeah, and then I kind of draw on that. And I'm like, oh God, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> so does that mean you have to write at a certain time of day or do something any different than you would for some of your other books? So do you mean just to kind of get in that character? Mm -hmm. I always listen to music when I'm writing. I have to, because the silence is too loud for me. I can't, it bothers me. So I have to listen to something. Um, and for the young Elise, I listen to a lot of like dark, angry, you know. Wagner. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Do you still draw before you write? I, I do, mean, yeah. I it's fascinating as someone who can't even draw a stick Thanks. figure that, that you, the visual is what brings you in. How does that work? Yeah, yeah it's a huge part of my process. Um, before I was a full-time writer, I used to work in video games as a concept artist. So I can't actually get into my character's headspace unless I see them physically on paper. Um, so before every story, I do draw out all my characters. Um, and when I'm procrastinating on my writing, I also draw out my characters. And it helps me think. physical description then is something that you actually really enjoy doing because mm -hmm. that visual sense is so strong with you? I do enjoy that a lot. And sometimes I get a little carried away with it and my editor has to pull me back a little bit from doing that. I want to talk about Adelina a bit because I think yeah. it is so interesting that you went from writing, you know, the, the dual narrative, one of the great things about the Legend series, you have this dual narrative and you sympathize with both of them, which I thought was sort of very interesting. But to go to a villain or a villainous character, we hear a lot that teen readers want a relatable character. Or like, right. did, you, did you give thought to that? Did you have misgivings about, well, I'm giving them somebody who's, who's pretty complicated. It was a little bit unnerving in the beginning because Adelina is not the most likable person. You know, she does pretty bad things. But um, at the same time, I think, again, we all have that little bit of darkness in ourselves and those moments, you know, where we wish we had said something or done something um, or, you know, someone has, has wronged us in some way. And I think, at least for me, I get those moments. And I remember those moments. And so I wanted to create a character who... Um, kind of falls to that and succumbs to that and uh, hopefully that's something that people can kind of relate to on some level even though we don't always act out on our you know moments where we're like oh I wish I had gotten you know revenge at that moment or whatever but I think it's something that hopefully people can relate to. And I like it because I think you're bucking this sort of double standard we sometimes have with female characters where what a male character could get away with right. is difficult, right. you know, then they're just interesting. But when you see a female character, we're coming at it through a different lens and people might have a little bit less patience with that. And yeah. So for you to take this character and be like, she's going to go to these places. Thank you. Yeah, I really wanted to explore that because like you said it's kind of either like the nice female character or the strong the female strong strong yeah in I quotation know you and Veronica Roth have talked a lot about the strong <laughs> the strong female, female characters what right does that mean? tell me yeah because the, the strong female character is a term that never gets applied to male characters you know male characters are they exist and they are human and they are people they can be everything from right. you know weak to strong to bad to good and so on and i feel like that's an area that still being expanded on with female characters, mm -hmm. uh, there's there's kind of a stigma, I, I think, against certain types of characters, and it's in they don't appear that often. 
um, there's not a lot of villainesses, there's not a lot of girls who get to be bad and kind yeah. of own that. And it does seem like it's starting that. to change. I yeah. Mean, earlier we had um, Alexander Bracken here and we had, mm -hmm. you know, um, Margie Stoll who's writing the new uh, Black, Black Widow, Widow yeah. book. And so you're starting to see these kind of characters come out and there seems to be a strong demand. I don't want to use the word strong. A demand. <laughs> you can use strong and high contact. It works, yes. But for, for, for more multifaceted characters and different types of female characters. So it seems like it's starting to happen right now, I mean, mm -hmm. especially. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's happening in film, too, which is nice to see. But, like, Maleficent, you know, did really well. Right. Um, Charlize Theron and Mad Max is amazing. Yeah. So it's nice to see that. I agree. Well, Marie, it's been really cool to have you here. Thank you. Rose Society, very exciting. Your large banner is very exciting. Young Elites, um, a wonderful new series for you. And I really appreciate you making time for us and to talk to Gail and I. Thanks yeah. for having me. Thanks so much. Yeah. We're going to now leave. We're going to go. Well, when we come back, we have Sarah Dessen. And we look forward to closing out our show with Sarah and Gail. And thanks again, Marie. Thank you. I'm Rich Folley of BookView Now on PBS.org, and we are at BookCon 2015 at the Javits Center in New York City. BookCon is the most spectacular gathering of passionate book readers in the country, focused a lot on the YA categories, graphic novels, comics, and books for young readers. It is an amazing group of passionate people all in one place with the authors who write the books that inspire this generation. We've got John Green, we've got Tony DiTerlizzi, We've got Jeff Smith who writes Bone. We've got Michelle Mead. We've got Jenny Han. We've got so many more running around this place, and so many of them are going to be coming right here to our set at BookView Now. At BookCon, readers come from all over the country to get close to the authors they love and to be around other readers who share the same passions they do. You'll never find people who love the books more than the people that are at BookCon, and you're going to see a lot of them today. I've heard some really interesting comments lately about reading and how many people are reading today and whether or not we're losing readers. Well, I have news. If you look around here, it'll be very clear. Your kids' parents are reading way more than you are. They're attached to these series like John Green and Hollywood's noticed. If you look at the movies that are coming out now, there's so many movies, many of them that are here at BookCon, that are based on these incredibly popular books. Look at the social media followings of these authors. Hundreds of thousands in some cases, millions in some cases. Some of the most explosive energy in books and publishing today is coming from the categories that you'll see represented here at BookCon. So enjoy all the energy, enjoy all the passion. Take a look outside, see all the people that are running through this place and have a great time with us here at BookView Now. Hi, Rich Folley. I'm here on the BookView Now set, bookviewnowpbs.org. And this is BookCon 2015. And we've reached our last segment of the day with our guest host, Gail Foreman and Sarah Dustin. It's so nice to have you. You look lovely in yellow. Thank really you. Nice. A little pop of color to keep you awake on yes. this Saturday. And I just found out that for both of you, this is the last stop on your oh, tours. I feel like virtual wine, everybody. Yes, Here we, we go. Should be, so we cheers. Should be having a big cheers. old glass. I want some. <laughs> I gave you some. That was a glass of virtual okay, wine. Okay, I'm drinking it right now. Thank Take you. Take your virtual wine, Rich. Well, congratulations. Those are big moments, actually. It for is. St. Maybe for you, but you have a paper back out, too. And for Gail, for, um, I was here. And it's a very cool thing to, like, finish that all off. It is. And it's, I think... Um, it's been a really fun, and I've traveled all over the country, and um, I've met a lot of readers and seen a lot of readers. What's been really cool about this particular, since I'm coming up on like 20 years of writing books. All right, high five, 20 high years. High five, 20 years. That's amazing. Oh, that is cool. Having girls come through that are like, I started reading your books when I was in middle school, and now I'm in college, or I started reading your books in high school, and now here I am with my baby on my hip. You know, I mean, it's, it's seeing how the readers just keep coming back to YA is pretty amazing. So. When they stay with you is the most impressive thing for both of you. Really great careers in writing, and you've done other things too. But here you have these uh, readers who've stuck with you. And in fact, new gener like uh, even a younger generation is now pushing into the stuff that you've done. How cool is that to like have, sort of have some staying power in this business? I mean, that's amazing to me because I've seen people with, I've done quite a few events with Sarah, and it's people who started when they were 13 
and are 33, look at me doing math, right. and they're still reading you. Right. Which I think speaks to your work and the fact that even if you're writing about the teenage years, I'm still reading your work, right. and I'm about to turn 45. So, and I'm about to turn 45. And I Sarah and I have this. I am one day older than Sarah Dessen. Just kidding. It's one day. Yes. One day, yes. one day yes. older. One day older. I um, like that you both admitted and said your age out loud. I have many people here who don't even say that. Oh please, no. Yeah. I'm owning 45. Bring it. I'm ready. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it likes me to my 40s to start figuring stuff out. Yeah. So I'm not going to start hiding it now. Well, um, I think what's really cool about why, like you were saying, people continuing to read it is that for some people, it's like high school was really intense and they didn't want to read about high school when they were in high school. It was bad enough to just be in high school. <laughs> you so were one of those I people. I was one of those people. I was not happy at all in high school. But if you have the distance of adulthood, you can kind of put yourself back in there with that safety. Mm -hmm. of, you know, you can put your back on the emotions, but you're not reading it and then living it also. So I think there's something to be said for that. But your stories, I mean, I know you always talk about your books being about high school, but your books, I always call you the Ann Tyler of YA. Very nice because your books are just these very intricate, nuanced, subtle family dramas. And yes, they're about high school students, and yes, there's usually um, always like a lovely romance there, but it's really the family drama that is always center stage. And we, most of us live in families. Like that is incredibly resonant throughout your life. I think that's true. And I think the family are the people that you can't get away from for better or for worse. It's, and and it's those relationships like the, we talked earlier today about relationships with your friends changing and how friends kind of come and go and sometimes you lose friends for various reasons but your family you are always going to be with like it or not you know um, so my mom tells me that all the time I know you're yeah. stuck with me like you're it or not like I'm like alright yeah. I'm going to work this out so and the, it's the ongoing the, the relationships have to change in order to survive and so um, I think I never think that my books are about any one thing you know I, I think that's why I have a hard time boiling them down to like one sentence which people like in this right. no elevator pitch no yeah. elevator pitch it's like because when I was in high school my life was never about one thing. It was never just about my friends or about my after school job or about my mom or about school. It was everything. Well, that yeah. makes it hard for the idea to come crashing through the roof into your lap to start writing. If you're, if it's about everything, you never know when it's going to show up, when right. the next bolt of inspiration is. Will you come talk up. about how this book came to be in, in terms of the idea crashing into your lap? Because it was kind of a interesting story. It was. I um, was working on another book before this book. I have a tendency to write books that don't How work. How many books have you written that I, you have? I have 13 abandoned manuscripts and 12 published books. So if you look at the numbers, that's not very good. Um, but I was working on another book. And when I was in high school, like I said, I was, I was kind of unhappy. And I, I went through a pretty dark period where I was just not dealing with my sadness in the most ideal way. And I'll just say that to protect my parents like me. Um, so, and I always wanted to write about whatever I did. It just felt too close and it was just too weird. So I'd started this book about a girl that was in a similar situation. The book was not working. I abandoned it and I was like, oh, you know, and then as Gail pointed out recently that sometimes you have to come to a story sideways. So I started to think after a while, what if I came at it about a person who's going through this dark time, but from the family's point of view um, and what happens when one member of the family is suddenly in a place that nobody has been before and, and it's a whole new world and how that disrupts all of the relationship. So that's, and once I came at it that way, it opened it up. Yeah, once something. you sort of reposition. But I was going to think, if 13 abandoned manuscripts, I was going to say, wow, a brave move to abandon a manus manuscript. But you've done it 13 uh -huh. times. 13 and I don't know how many, if yeah. that's a normal number for uh, I, a I think she's doing the brave move now. It's just she's normally, Sarah, wants to start a book right away. And she's kind of saying, I'm not going to start. I'm not ready. Right. Yeah, that's the brave move. I'm worried think. that the failed manuscript between the successful ones is like part of my process, and so since I haven't started the one that's going to fail yet, yeah. I'm setting myself back. No, I, I think you can change your process. I think I can I think change you my say, process. Like, I'm going to do it different. And when I put the picture of this, I put them all out in my driveway, mm -hmm. um, and I took a picture and I put on my blog post. I said, "Impressive or depressive, you decide." <laughs> but I think some, if something's not working, at least I'm getting better at realizing it. Like I used to write the whole book and then be like, "This yeah. book is not good." Then I would write like. Now you only date for two weeks. Now, like, yes, this is now, not. Now, this now is not it's marriage only material. Like, you know, 100 pages rather than 300 pages. And, but walking you know. to the unknown, not knowing what the next book is, I'm sure is frightening. Um, if you're still getting adjusted to the idea of not knowing, you know, like it sounds like you like to know, and if you don't know, and you just kind of go, oh, I'm going to go, and hopefully it'll arrive. That's the sort of brave part. It's a leap of faith. faith. Yeah, it very much is. And with Saint Anything, it was like I was like, I got nothing. Like yeah. I, I was just like, I'm sitting here day after day in my office. Did you show up every day? I well, I just sat in my office and hoped to God that something would happen, you know. And it's yeah. really hard sometimes. Like you get this great support from other authors on Twitter, 
But you also see everyone else is like, hashtag I'm writing, I'm writing. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not writing, I got nothing. If they were yeah. hashtag I'm writing, they would not be on Twitter. That's hashtag exactly. I'm writing. Yeah, right. exactly. So right. you kind of have to put on your blinders and, and just say, and I just, you have to have faith, which is scary for me. I like to be yeah. in control of everything. Yeah. So, and obviously I'm not, but I give myself that feeling. So, but I, I really, you know, this is the end of the tour. If I have one egg, you know, a one place, one basket to put all my proverbial eggs in right now, saying anything is that basket, and I'm it's a good, I'm basket. A good place to put it. So yeah. I'm thrilled that it's there. So well, we'll I'm see. thrilled that the you spent the end of your tour and the end of your tour. I'm glad we're together. Like right here <laughs> on the set of Book View Now <laughs> at PBS.org. Yeah. Yay! How about a high five for the end of the tour, baby? Woo! Yeah. Like crossing yeah. the marathon finish line. <laughs> Woohoo! 26.2. We did it. We did it. And you I close out our show. It's yeah. like there's just something so symbolic about that. I'll you know, take Rich, it. Thank yeah. you for being in this very special, special moment. Yeah, thanks it's really for cool. I feel like I was like part of something. You are. So, yeah. You're part of it. We're yeah, all here thank together. Thank you. <laughs> it was wonderful to have you both. And to all of you watching on Book View Now, thank you for being here today. We look forward to tomorrow's coverage. We've got some amazing authors. I'd reel through them, but there's way too many. It's going to be another very full day. Thanks for being here today. Book View Now on PBS.org. This is BookCon 2015. Funding for Book View Now is provided by the Wincote Foundation.